All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us for our session today, Strategic Deconstruction of Text to Improve the Comprehension of Struggling Readers. All right, so uh, with that, I would like to introduce our presenter today. Um, Iris has been an educator for 25 years. She has been both a classroom teacher and a reading specialist in K through eight, in grades K through eight, and is currently a professor of reading at Northwest Florida State College. She's also been a regular presenter of ours at the Florida Literacy Conference and has presented multiple webinars on reading for us as well. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Iris. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're here. We'll get started. If you have any questions, then um, hold up, put them in the, in the question box so that that way we can answer those. So we're going to look at strategic deconstruction of text to improve comprehension of struggling readers. We must have objectives. So by the end of the session, you will be able to define deconstruction of text. You'll be able to demonstrate strategic or close reading instruction. You will be able to summarize a passage by transforming information and building connections to the text. And you'll be able to explain the code to analyze reading passages. The first thing I would like you to do in your chat box is answer the following question. In what capacity do you serve underprepared learners? Are you a teacher? Are you an administrator, a volunteer, or other? And if you'll just type that in the chat box. Okay, we have a little bit of everything, lots of teachers, tutors, that's great. We appreciate you doing what you do. If you'll look at this uh, now, right now, this image, and just keep watching it, and you'll see that it does change. Watch it again. You'll have this image. And then all of a sudden it changes. The reason that I am showing you this frog to horse is because our students think that they know how to read and they struggle through it and they'll tell you they hate reading. Our job is to show them the patterns that exist in reading passages so that they can go to other passages and identify similar patterns and be able to use that information to read better. So here's the frog, if you did not see it, here's his head, then you go back down to his feet, and then here's the horse, his, his uh, nostrils, here's his eyes, here are the ears, and here's the mane. So that's just to show that we need to change something, some of the information that we give our students so they are better prepared to read. It's all based on patterns. As you all know, life is based on patterns. Math has patterns. English has patterns. Reading definitely has patterns. And those patterns need to be given to the students. How do we give those to students? They come in strategies. The strategies to help them gather information, analyze and clarify information, and then examine supporting details, separate fact from opinion, and consider the author, the perspective of the author. If you could go ahead and read through this short scrambled text. I'll give you like a minute. Okay, I think most of you have had time to read through it. Some of you have seen this before. And what you're going to do now is write the answer for the statement in the chat box. I was able to fluently read the scrambled uh, passage, yes or no. Just put a yes or a no. Okay, most of you did not have any trouble reading it. Let's go through and see why you did not have any trouble reading it. This is a passage that is scrambled but you can figure it out. This would be an example of what one of your struggling students might see as he or she looks at a passage that he or she doesn't want to read. So you, we are living in an English speaking country. So therefore, you start at the left, upper left. I don't think anybody tried to start at the bottom or on the right hand side. We start at the left, and then as you begin this horrible scrambled mess, 
and you start reading it, I could not believe that I could actually understand what I'm reading. It's because suddenly you see there's a pattern. You are able to figure out the code. And once you figure out the code, you are able to fluently read. I even tried to mess you up a bit. And that was right here with the SI. Actually, the pattern was that you could not do that to, you always had to start with the, the initial letter, I is, so it had to be is, but I messed that up. And if you did stop, you might have even stopped just for a millisecond as you read through it. So patterns, there is a pattern. We recognize some patterns. It helped us to get through this awful text. We're gonna look at strategies. Strategies are the key. They're the procedures that are gonna guide your students as you attempt to read and write. It's the why, how, when, where questions that we all know well, they were drilled into us when we were in elementary school. Unfortunately, our struggling readers sometimes forget them, really never learned them or understood how to use them, or just never did, never, never used them at all, ever. So strategic or close reading is a deeper examining or analyzing of text through purposeful rereading and connecting of ideas. And I'll tell you, my students, they do not purposefully read, they do not reread, and they do not connect the ideas. And that's why they cannot summarize an article or a text, piece of text. Let's look at what the literature says. It also enables this close reading, enables students to reflect on the meaning of individual words and sentences, the order in which sentences unfold, and the development of ideas over the course of time. So you start small with the individual words, move to the order in which the sentences unfold, and then you have those ideas that come forward so you understand the text. This all ultimately leads to students to arrive at an understanding of the text as a whole, that comprehension piece. Strategic close analytic reading stresses engaging directly with the text of sufficient complexity, directly examining its meaning thoroughly and methodically and encouraging students to read and reread deliberately. Directing student attention to the text itself empowers students to understand the central ideas and key supporting details. And that's where we want them, that understanding piece. So Dr. Reutzel said that close reading is not starting with the big idea and then moving to the details. He says, close reading is starting with the details and moving to the big ideas. He continues to say that there are two areas that you're looking at for this, and that's construction. Read the text to determine what the text actually says. Then you move on to reading the text again to make inferences, whether they're global or local read the text again and combine with background knowledge to determine the meaning and then read the text again to share what was learned in writing speaking or visually four times minimum students should read the text they don't they don't even get through the first time because they're trying to see how they can skip over things and answer the questions that, that are given to them. So this is the deconstruction strategy. Strategy. First, you must consider the individual elements of the text. When we went through them, your sentences, your paragraphs, all of that that compile that, that text. Then move sentence by sentence. Yes, I said sentence by sentence, deconstructing the sentences for meaning. Then reconstruct each component part and reassemble the content into a sequence of meaning. That is 
deconstructing that uh, text. So let's see how it works using pictures. This cartoon is an excellent way to begin showing how to do this to your students. You're going to write down two details, well not write them, you're going to post them in the chat box. Two details, pick out two, it doesn't matter which ones, pick out two and put them into the chat box. And I'll give you again about a minute to do that. Okay. Most of you got your answers. You could have written down any of these. The black swirling eyes of the individual, the pale white skin, the large band-aid. All of these work as your details. Now, among all these details, there's an important one. It's the most important, I must have that detail that, that you are now going to again put into the chat box. Which detail that is up there is the most important, must have it to get this right detail? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat box. Okay. And I'm hoping everybody put Florida. This is the man's name. If you could not or recognize that your students will not, they'll put everything else in there and they'll skip over Florida, but that that is the most important detail, the major detail that pulls this thing together. Why? Because otherwise, if I ask you, what is the cartoonist trying to say? My students answer, well, this guy, he's drunk and he got beat up in a bar. Okay, the thing is, there's no bottles, broken bottles anywhere. There's not a bar mentioned. So therefore, it's not a bar. There's no man in a bar. It cannot be that. So now that we have Florida, and you've got Florida, and this guy has the eyes, the swirling black eyes, the broken teeth, what would be the point that the cartoonist is trying to make? In one sentence, starting with a capital letter and ending with a period, state the point of the cartoon in the chat box. What is the point that the cartoonist is trying to make? And some of you are really nailing it. You're doing a great job. Your students will not, however. They would not be doing a good job with this. So the point of the cartoon is Florida has been beaten up by hurricanes or something similar that you have written. Now it makes sense. Do you see why Florida is so important that has to be pointed out to the students that it is the major detail. The other details fall underneath it so that you can get to the point. What's the point of this cartoon? This one's an easy one. You dialed a wrong number. The point is, it's death answering the phone, the grim, deeper, grim reaper. So that is an easy one to discover. We're gonna move on to text. Does anyone have a question so far? If you do, please put it in the question box. Okay, we'll move on then. Another short cartoon with the text. Our marriage has problems. He likes to spend money, I like to save it. He's a night person, I'm a day person. He likes sports. I hate them. So once again, what would be the author's point of this cartoon? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat box. Okay. Most of you have figured that one out. That one's not a difficult one. It's that first sentence. Our marriage has problems. Every sentence that follows it is a problem. So that is how you are able to quickly come to that comprehension piece, that understanding of what it's about. Now we're gonna move into strategic close reading a little bit more. And you'll have to remember to use those, those who, what, when, why, where, how questions that we learned way back in elementary school. So deconstructing text from comprehension actually 
was uh, coined by Jacques Derrida. He was a French philosopher, and he tried to explain understanding between text and meaning. And he did it by, again, trying to break down text into smaller parts. Let's see how this works. You have the operator of a newsstand reported to the police that a customer asked for change for a large bill, but actually had a small bill. Now in that sentence, you ask the who. You have three who's. You've got the operator, you've got the police, and my students go, oh, bad, the police are there. And you've got the customer. Now you have something going on with change, with the large bill and the small bill. You should have understanding of that first sentence. Let's look at two, sentence two. The police soon brought the vendor a suspect. Is there anything repeated from sentence one? Oh yes, we've got police here and police there. We got the vendor here and in sentence one, it was the operator. And then we have the suspect who in sentence one was the customer. Now we have sentence one, sentence two makes sense. They, they, there's nothing else that we need to, to learn. Now, sentence three, you've got, although the newsstand operator was blind, uh-oh, blind? That was never mentioned. There's something new, new information. The suspect was, was proven guilty of the fraud. What's the fraud? You go back to sentence one, something with the money, change for large bill and small bill. That the vendor, the vendor who was mentioned here is a suspect, I'm sorry, not as a suspect, a, vent, a vendor who is mentioned in a sentence two as a vendor and sentence one as the newsstand operator. Uh, the vendor recognized the suspects something. I've, I purposely left off the rest of it because that's part of that deconstruction. You have to think of, infer, what would be coming there? Originally, this has um, the A, B, C, D answers that you could choose. But if I put those up right away, the students, they're just gonna guess. And I'll show you how that works in, in a couple of seconds here. So with this one, there's your who, the operator of the newsstand, and you've got the police and the customer. There's an important word there, but. But is called a transition, and it comes off of that. Uh, there's a chart that lists all the different transitions get, that can be used, and it's one that is contrast. Something different's going to happen. You go in one direction, and all of a sudden it goes in a def different direction. So there's your who again, the three people that are involved, and then you've got another transition, although, and that although also is in the same list as but, it's contrast, something different is going to happen. So there we have that, and we've uh, figured that out. Again, we're looking for a word to finish off what it says. There's a problem, and the problem had to do with that money that was stated, something it was called fraud in the uh, last sentence, fraud. So moving on, there's your, there's your set text that you're analyzing. If you'll go ahead in the chat box, answer and fill in what's, what, what's the word, what's missing here? Recognize the suspects what? If you'll put that in the chat box. Okay, I think most of you have gotten it. Uh, do you feel you have an understanding of this text now? If again, you'll answer in the chat box, just put a yes or a no. Oops, I'm giving you. There are the, the uh, rest of the, the, the paragraph, the, the questions that would have been asked. The vendor recognized the suspects what? What word did you use? Did it, is it close to what is here? One of the words that's, that's noted here. 
there's your clue, blind. And as you know, there are five sense, senses. You've got um, the visual, which apparently he, he's blind, so you could not use that. But then you have the other senses that possibly would work. Smell, mm, I don't think I'd want to smell that guy. Taste, no. Uh, touch, again, not sure that would be a good one. So the last one is here. That's the one I probably would go with. And that's the voice. So there's your answer. So I hope you got the right answer. I'm sure you did as you analyzed it. Now, my students, when I gave them the whole thing where they saw the ABCD words, they chose a wrong answer. In the chat box, if you'll, if you'll just figure out which of those words, A, B, C, D, was the word that the, my students guessed when I did not uh, get rid of the answers to show them. Just put that in again, the chat box. What incorrect word did my students guess when I did not, when I showed them the answer before they actually had worked through figuring it out what the text was all about. Did you guess fingerprints? Now some of my students on this, when, when later on I, I go through the same thing, guess photograph. But actually it is fingerprints because you think of the uh, CSI or the investigator types of shows they've seen, what do they move in and do the first thing after a crime? They look for fingerprints. And that's the, what the answer is usually given if I show them the actual words to, to finish it off. Now, let's try another one. You've got the common housefly, housefly carries germs, disease germs on the fine hairs of its legs. The filthy living habits of this insect make it a potential carrier of germs. People often consider the buzzing housefly merely a nuisance when it actually is. And before we go back to it, let's look at a code to sometimes get your people that you're in your class that really don't want to get into the text. This is a simple code to analyze passages. They go sentence by sentence again, de deconstructing. If they have understanding, they know what it means, it's a plus. I knew that already. I have the background, I knew it. So they just put a plus after that sentence. Minus means, I had no idea what I just finished looking at. I don't know what it means. And they just use those two symbols to kind of prime the pump, get started in that text. So here it is. And you'll notice I put a minus after the first sentence and a minus after the other. That would indicate that I didn't know that. That's new information to me. This again, I don't use it all the time. I throw it out there for my students just to kind of help them out. If they're sitting there going and looking at a text saying, I don't like this at all, I hate reading. It kind of gets them to move into the text. So as you have analyzed and deconstructed the text on your own, you've gone sentence by sentence. I want you to again, finish what it says. What did I leave off? The common housefly carries disease germs on the fine hairs of its legs. The filthy living habits of this insect make it a potential carrier of many germs. People often consider the buzzing housefly merely a nuisance when actually it is what? What would you put in the chat box? Okay, and there's your sentence, there's your words. So now which word matches your word? Which one is, is going to be the correct answer? And I know you all know it because there's your clues. It's dangerous. That is the word that you would have matched up. Now, again, looking at this text, which word is incorrect? Which one, if I had given this to the students just like this, what word did they choose as their guess, the incorrect word? And just put that in the chat box. 
Did you put common? Why would it be common? Because it's right there. It's the, it's the word they're reading right at the very beginning. Ah, oh, that must be it. It's connected to housefly. It's got to be it. So this is why I encourage you when you use these types of uh, text to illustrate how to deconstruct that strategy, make sure that you do not show them the answers. I have, when I pass them out as a handout in my regular class, I just give them an index card and they cover up the actual answers and have to look at what they have in the text before they answer. Let's try another one. You're going to analyze this on your own and you're going to answer in the chat box. When European kings in the 18th century took up the practice of having themselves anointed by the church, whoa, is that bad? Look at all those words strung together. So you probably would have to go through this with them, explain what European kings did. I you always use uh, uh, England as an example, King Arthur, and the eighth century, and then anointed by the church. What would that mean? And so you have to go through that. They, at that time, the Catholic church was very strong and they, they physically anointed said the blessing over the people that were going to be kings. Now, to oppose, oh, I'm sorry, uh, let me read that again. When European kings in the 18th, 8th century took up the practice of having themselves anointed by the church, they became thought of as God's own appointed rulers. To oppose such a king was then thought to be not only treason, but what? What could you put in that chat box. How would it be finished off? Okay. And here are the words to match it up with. So your clues are up there. They're circled. Does it match what you originally had? A sin. Now, if I would have just given the students everything, including the possible answers, my students chose criminal or felony. They didn't use the sin because they missed the clues of the church and God. So that's why, again, I encourage you, don't show them the answers. Okay, here's another one. Looks easy. This one's a tough one. The world's largest Gothic cathedral is the Episcopal Cathedral of St. John, John the Divine in New York. What, again, what a horrible sentence. So you probably would have to go through, explain to them about Gothic cathedrals. They understand usually the word Gothic. They think goth and they think they understand it. But you've got to probably give them a little bit of background, Gothic cathedral, and then talk about, again, um, the Episcopal Cathedral in New York, begun in 1892 and still not entirely completed, the Gothic style cathedral referred to humorously as St. John the, and in the chat back box, if you will go ahead and put in the answer. Okay, and then I'm going to show you what actually follows that I did not give you. Those were the words. And do you have a match? There's your big clue. And there it is. Now, uh, years ago, a couple of years ago, five years ago, Baptist was one that came up a lot as a wrong answer. But now they put divine just because again, what's in the it's in that sentence there. It says divine. But the answer, the correct answer is unfinished. Now we're going to do some more deconstructing of test. Do you, if you have a question, we'll please put it in the question box. Nicole, do we have any questions? Hi, yeah, we do have um, a question here. This one's from Mary with which grade level students did you use these examples? My students are adults. So I have, um, if you're talking about how far did they get in school, uh, what can, they can read, 
Some of them, maybe eighth grade education is where they are. Reading wise, they read like a fourth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, right around in there. I don't have any um, students that are young ones that I, I teach. They're all adults that are trying to um, improve themselves by going to college. Are your students uh, English language learners? Uh, some are very few. I've had, and, and I'll tell you, those are the students I absolutely adore. Now, of course, they, they are usually educated in their own country. So when I get them in my class, they already understand the concept of um, school, education, that whole thing. So yes, I, it, some of my best students that have ended up with A's because they work so hard and they are always asking questions. They want to know why. They, they're, they're remarkable. And of course, with them, all of them, we have vocabulary that I go through. I have a whole vocabulary program that I work with them on. Okay, so what would you recommend for lower level students? You're gonna to have to have easier passage. And you're lucky because at the end of this uh, PowerPoint, I have listed the places where I have found the different um, passages. And I'll point out one of them, well, not even one, I think three of them uh, start at grade one, first grade with passages, and then they go all the way up. That is probably where you'll want to pull some of your passages that you use. And that's at the end of this PowerPoint. All right, um, this is in reference to the, um, the pattern that you showed earlier today. Um, is, it, was that uh, pattern true in languages um, that use the same alphabet, other languages that use the same alphabet? That's a great question. It, again, well, sometimes they place, the other languages will place their verbs at the end. So you have to do a little bit of trying to figure out from that where they would have that particular piece fall. Because in English, if you've ever diagrammed sentences, you know that there's always a spot where a particular word, it has a job. So as teaching someone that either has no concept of the English language, it's going to be more difficult, more time consuming, and you're gonna really have to use very simple examples, and you're going to have to tell them about how in the English language every, every single uh, word has a purpose, has a job. And in English, normally those words fall in a particular pattern. So if you can figure out that pattern, you're going to figure out where those words will, will end up. And um, uh, those languages that have shifted the words around yeah, it's difficult. It's much, much more difficult with students that um, do not have that, that same view as the English language with, with the words being in a certain spot. I hope that kind of answered your question. Is that it or do we have another one? Um, we have one, uh, one more comment in response to the last question is, um, many of my students are uh, semi-literate in their home, uh, home language that's a big problem because you're going to have to go back to the very beginning and the latest research is saying we've always known there are five pillars of reading now it turns out according to the latest research the most important one if you are a beginner reader reader it's phonics you have to recognize the sound that correlates with that particular letter and then with the parts of the word. If they, if they are unable to do that, they're going to struggle with learning English. That's why right now we're having that big debate still on phonics versus uh, balanced reading for the younger grades. And according to the most recent research, phonics wins. You have to, you have to start with that because that's the way the English language is, 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 it's not that we magically wake up and we can read, we can't. 
We have to be able to understand that certain sounds go with certain letters, and then when you put those together, they create the words and move forward from that. So it's going to be difficult. Difficult. Use books. Right, and that's. I'm sorry. I would use books. No. That the easy, easy reads that type. I'll show you at the, when we get to the end of our uh, the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that that's the last of the questions for now. Oh, okay. All right. And I do, I, I admire those of you that are teaching the ones that are very, very uh, difficult and they don't have any background because that is, that's going to be very time consuming and you have to start way at the beginning. Here's another passage. You notice it's got gotten longer, more difficult, but it has patterns. You've already learned that there are some patterns already that you can use. Transitions are important. So let's look at this. Often when older children move back home, unpleasant tensions and disagreements arise. In that sentence, you've got those older children and obviously they've moved away and they've come back, moved back home and you've got bad stuff. Unpleasant things are coming up. Now you have another transition in sentence two, however, and it's in the same group. It's the contrast. It's going to be going opposite direction or different. However, adult children who move back home can avoid family conflicts by following some tips. So now you have still adult children. They're still back home. That's from sentence one. Now you're trying to avoid those conflicts mentioned in sentence one, and you've got some tips. First, they should contribute what they can, and it need not be to, in terms of money. Being productive family members will help them earn their keep. Sentence four says this can involve tutoring, coaching, younger sisters or brothers, or helping mom and dad with chores and errands. Sentence five says, second, these returnees should not expect their parents to rescue them from difficulties. Six says, as adults, they are responsible for getting out of their own scrapes and for trying to avoid them in the first place. Seven, last, they must respect their parents' lifestyle, lifestyles and own needs for independence. And eight, it is unrealistic to expect parents' lives to revolve around the needs of a grown child in the manner that they may have when the child was younger. All right, this is a difficult piece of text. It has a lot of things going, but again, the patterns are there. I always make sure I read out loud the text to the student. Even when they are working in their seats on their own and I walk around the room, I stop by and I help them. When they ask me, they'll say, I, I, I just can't figure this one out. I will read it out loud to them. And I tell them, well, I've got to do that for myself so that I get an understanding of what that author is saying, where that author is going. And so that way we work it out together. So here's your text. And you understand it's about adult children moving back home. This first sentence in red, it, it goes over just what we covered as we were doing the read through. Then the second sentence with that, however, which is important because it is a transition and it comes from contrast. They move back home and they can avoid conflicts by some tips. Just from those two sentences in the chat box, put in what you think is the focus of the rest of the paragraph. What do you think it will be? What will be, what will the rest of the paragraph talk about? What do you think? And write that in, I mean, put that in the chat box. There's your whole paragraph if you need it. Okay, everybody's got an answer. So we went over that with the, how this is all set up. So there's your answer that you should have placed in your chat box, it's tips. If you look at the rest of the paragraph where I have put the arrows, you've got those words first, second, last. Do you recognize them from anything earlier? They are showing you order. 
So you've got uh, the first thing you have to do is that, the so second that, and the last thing. And they're all related. The whole, all of the rest of the information is regarding the tips. It's still about older children. It's still about moving home. It's, it's talking about how to, to uh, be able to avoid those conflicts. And you have the rest of the, the, the passage that easily can be deciphered. Now, as you're looking at it, I put blue color there because remember when we did the cartoon, I asked you for that major detail and then you had the minor detail. Minor details were the other's information. Well, the colors that you have major details following the first, second, and last, those are your major details for each part of this, this text. Then your minor details in that light blue, it's like sentence four, sentence six, because that is further information and that actually could go away. You could have a paragraph if you just went with what's in the black letters and then if you had the first, the second, and the third, that would create your text, that would be fine. What the blue does it adds that extra something, explanation. And some, sometimes it gives background, more background to some of the students who do not have it. And we call those minor details the ones that are in the blue. Now we're up to writing a summary. You should have uh, realized tips is what it's about. That again is shown because the rest of the paragraph, the whole thing, starting with sentence three to the end, is about the tips. The first tip, the second tip, and the last tip, plus those minor details that give you further explanation. So knowing that, and you know you're gonna have to use tips in your summary, I need a one sentence summary, starting with a capital letter, ending with a period, that is going to have the su summarize the entire text. So if you'll write that down, here's your text back so you can see it. I need one sentence that's a summary for the entire text. Did you write this? Adult children who move back home can avoid family conflicts by following some tips or close to that because that explains the entire text. And this is again, if you were going to uh, show the students how you would deconstruct each part of it. And I use the different colors that to, to help that go along. That first sentence, usually it's not, most students think it's gonna be the main idea because they've been taught go to the main idea. But in this case, it's an introductory sentence. It, it just serves to introduce that particular concept, whatever's coming. And the question that was about um, showing students who are, who do not have a good educational background, have, have perhaps not gone very far in their, in their school, this is uh, really difficult for them because they're still struggling with the simple sentences. Since this is a complicated one, you would not use it with, with that group. It would have to be the, the ones that are already are understanding how text is created, and especially with English language. Each word that is in the first sentence has a purpose, but when it's put together as that sentence and looked at for the rest of the sentences for that passage, it's an introduction. That all, that, that's all it serves to do. It just introduces. Then you'll see sentence two, there's your summary. There's what the whole passage is going to be about. You've got adult children who move back home can avoid family conflicts by following some tips. How do I know that? Well, one way is you've got those first, second, last indicators, the transitions that help you realize, oh, these are tips. What's tip number one? They contribute what they can. What's tip number two? They shouldn't expect their parents to save them. What's tip number three? They should respect their parents' lifestyles. 
And again, that could be the paragraph, just what, what we uh, read by eliminating all the other. The other sentences are helpful because they give you more information. And this is what we'd like to see when they write, that they write something like this paragraph that you're looking at. Now, before we move into that one, are there any other questions? Nicole, nothing? Apologies. <laughs> no, it took okay. me a while to unmute myself. Um, so you mentioned vocab your vocabulary program, yeah. and someone is just curious about that. Okay, I use the Townsend Press. And again, it's a higher level, although he does, I think he does go down to possibly, I'm trying to think, fourth grade maybe. But I use the upper levels because again, my students, most of them are, um, they're, they're already in, in college. So that is, is a great program because it's so structured. It gives you the, the words that, that uh, there are 10 words for each, each uh, chapter. And as they learn the 10 words, they have to go through several different um, uh, activities to strengthen those words. Um, it's also online. So you could, um, if, and mine's online because we buy, buy the, uh, the actual program. But they, they, he has the hardback books and it's called Townsend Press. Town, like, like a little town, T-O-W-N, Press, Townsend Press. And you can go, I think it's townsendpress.com will get you to the link and you can see what he does offer. I've, I, I, I have found nothing better uh, that's out there for what I need. Now, if you have those um, uh, students that are coming from a country where they did not get much, much education, then you are going to have to look for something that has the words that are not quite as difficult. So they can start with that and it should be structured. It should, it should have a beginning point, it should have a middle point, and it should just build so that it makes sense. That's why I like Townsend. It's not like you, you have these words and they come out of nowhere. It's a, it starts with a whole story about something that's connected to the words and all 10 words are within that story. And then it moves to, they have to do matching exercises with it, fill in the blank, that type of, of thing. And the students that um, I have had that, that again, they're, they're coming, they have education, they appreciate it because it is so structured. It just, it moves from one place to another place and you don't get lost in between. I'm sorry I could not be more helpful about it, but I know there's, for younger students or for students that do not have the background, I know there are materials out there. I would start with Townsend and they could probably guide you because they are just a wonderful, wonderful company. I hope I kind of answered that. Any other that's questions? The, uh, that's the last question we have for now. Okay, and we're moving on then. This one, again, you should know patterns. We've discussed several patterns. Stereotyping consists of assigning traits to people solely on the basis of a category. Some researchers suggest that stereotyping has four clear phases. First, a, a person distinguishes some category of people. For example, economists. Second, the person notes that one or more of the people in this category have certain traits. For example, dullness. Third, the person generalizes that everyone in his category has these characteristics. For example, that all economists are dull. Finally, when meeting someone the person is not acquainted with, but knows to be, for example, an economist, the person stereotypes this individual as dull. Okay, again, I always read through it with my students I read it out loud. I want to hear them. Uh, I, want to, I want to make sure that they hear me pausing and then moving forward so that they can see that uh, this is how English is spoken. This is how you read. Some of them say they hear my voice in their heads sometimes when they 
are reading through something, which is okay with me. I'm, I'm good with that. Now, what do you think will be the focus of the rest of the paragraph? If you'll again answer in the chat box, here's the passage. You're looking for the focus. Okay. Did you have something like four clear phases? Stereotyping has four clear uh, phases, something in that area. And as you can see from my arrows, there they are. You have uh, the first one in sentence three, that's one phase. Then you have second in sentence four. These are all again transitions there and you can find the transit, the list of transitions um, online, just put in transitions and they'll come up. There's a whole list. This is giving you order. So the second one, you know that that's going to be coming after. And the next one then is sentence five, which is third. And then finally, you have finally, which is in sentence six. These words, these transitions are indicators of the sentence that has usually the major detail. And in this one, this is a little harder than the last one that we looked at. This one, this in sentence three, you've got first a person distinguishes some category of people. That is your major detail. It has to be there. If it's not there, then your paragraph is not going to make sense. Now, in this, within it, not separate, there we go. Okay, so we were back to sentence three, that's your major detail. Then, if you'll notice, they don't have separates, separate details. It just goes on with an example. For example, right there, economists. That's a minor detail. That could not stand by itself here, the way it's written. And it's just tagging on to that first one. The second one here, you've got, that's your major detail. And, uh, the person notes that one or more people in the category have certain traits. Now you have the same words, for example, and you've got dullness. Then in the third one, here's your major detail. Third, the person generalizes that everyone in this category has these characteristics. Minor detail, for example, all economists are dull. Then the last one, finally, when meeting someone the person is not acquainted with, but knows to be, that's your major, coming up with the, for example, an economist, the person stereotypes this individual as dull. I hope you're recognizing this pattern from the previous text that we looked at that also started out giving you the different types of information that was listed so that you could follow it very easily. It's good to know this is a common, common pattern in English language. So if they can understand this pattern, and some of my students, after they've practiced with it, right away they say, oh, oh, I see this. We've looked at this pattern before. Yes, you have. So you can figure out from it where it's going and you will have compre uh, comprehension. Now, that first sentence, stereotyping consists of assigning traits to people solely on the basis of one category. That again is an introductory sentence, just like it was in the other text that we looked at. So that means that you should have, there's your, there's your, um, what your, your, what you're looking for. That is your focus. And if you follow it through, there it is. There's your main idea or your summary. Some researchers suggest stereotyping has four clear phases. It's right there within that text, that's sentence number two. So we're going to go on and look again at strategic close reading. Remember the questions, who, what, where, when, why, how. And we're going to be looking at this particular text. First, the plane's engine caught on fire and continued to burn. 
you already should know something about the word first. When Amelia Earhart flew to higher altitude trying to put out the fire, icebergs, I mean, I'm sorry, ice began to build up on the plane's wings. From start to finish, Amelia Earhart's first solo Atlantic transatlantic flight was filled with near disasters. The weight of the ice on the plane's wing finally forced her to come down. Because the clouds were so low and thick during her descent, she almost crashed into the ocean. By the time Amelia finally spotted the coast of Ireland, she was so far off course that her plane was nearly out of fuel. That word first is that's another transition that's, uh, that's showing you order. And the first thing it tells you, there's a plane, we're on a plane, that's that, where are we? We're on a plane. What about it? Bad news. It's on fire and continue to burn. When Amelia Earhart flew to higher altitude trying to put out the fire that comes from sentence one, we're still in the plane, ice began to build on the plane's wings. Now you've got that uh, who, who, who is Amelia Earhart. Then where are we? We're in a plane. What's, the, what's going on? Well, there's fire and there's ice. So just in those few uh, couple of sentences, we are able to deconstruct and have meaning, we have understanding, because uh, we are able to use that who, what, where, when to figure it out. There's your ice that she encountered. So she has fire and ice. We know that she's on a plane and she's having some problems. This sometimes is called the journalistic, journalistic model to deconstruct a paragraph. And again, you're looking at the word first. It's important because you know that first, second, third, somewhere, it's gonna show you something happened in order. You've got also the woman, Amelia Earhart. We know there's fire and ice, and that, if you go to the middle of the, there it is, that's disasters. So you would be able to, your students would be able to see that you're doing a, almost a categorization. Why is fire and ice important? Because they are disasters. And that means a lot to Amelia Earhart, who's in a plane that's falling apart. Now it says, from start to finish, with the green, that's time again, from start to finish. Amelia Earhart's first solo a transatlantic flight was filled with near disasters. The weight of the ice, we're back to ice. We knew we heard that before. It was in sentence two on the wings plane, forced her to come down because the clouds, ooh, that's new, isn't it? Clouds. Now clouds are so low and thick she almost crashed in the ocean. The clouds, if you'll follow that red, it also shows you that's a disaster. By the time Amelia Earhart finally spotted the coast of Air, uh, Ireland, she was so far off course that her plane was nearly out of fuel. So there it is. That's what we have um, deconstructed. So the who is Amelia Earhart. The where, she's in an airplane. What about that, her experience? It's her first solo transatlantic flight. When did it happen? From start to finish. And then why? It's all those disasters that are coming into play. And as you are working through this, each one of those who, where, or what can be found in the original text. The how is fire, ice, running out of fuel. The topic in question is the same thing. It's, it's part of the deconstruction. You can have, we did it by, by asking what was the focus. So your focus and topic are the same. So what is the fo focus of this particular text? It's Amelia Earhart's first solo at South uh, Transatlantic Flight. It's also called the topic. Now you ask a question. So what? What about Amelia Earhart's first solo transatlantic flight? 
Well, we knew it had ice and there was fire, low clouds. So it's disasters. Everything there was not good for Amelia Earhart. So as you would summarize that particular text, you put all of this together. And where did it come from? Who, what, where, when, all that that we worked through. Amelia Earhart's first solo transatlantic flight was filled with near disasters. And if you put it all together, there is your main idea, your summary. Amelia Earhart's first solo transatlantic flight was filled with near disasters. Now, support is important. Your students need to understand when paragraphs, when text is written, usually you have that main idea that is the most important sentence in text. The rest of the sentences support it. So we have the same passage. We've already gone through it. Your main idea, your most important sentence from start to finish, Amelia Earhart's first solo Atlantic flight was filled with near disasters. And here's your support. The engine caught fire. Ice building on the plane's wings. The weight of the ice forced her to land. She almost crashed in the ocean because of the clouds. She was far off course and almost out of fuel. All of these are indicators of support. And, and that's the reason that that sentence, that main idea sentence is the most important sentence. It summarizes what's going on. There's your support to show you that's what it is. These are the passages, the links to the passages that I was talking to you about earlier that you might want to take a look at to get some ideas. And um, many of them go down to, well, actually some of them go down to, to K, to kindergarten. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that you will find something that you can use that, that is there. And that is it. We are done. If you have any more questions, Nicole, are there any more? There is one question here right now. Um, is there any value in having students read parts of the passage? In, in what sense? Parts of the passage, certainly as if you're deconstructing, you start with the entire passage and then, yeah, the parts when you go through and analyze, sure. Um, I'm not sure where that question is leading, where it's going, but yes, certainly. If you're, ta oh, if you're asking, can I take sections out of a longer text to deconstruct? Certainly. But be aware, when you do that, you might have to give them some background. If that's what you're talking about, can I remove a section from text and, and just focus on that and then go back in the original? Certainly. But you might have to either summarize what happened before or after or they might be bewildered. They may not understand what you are uh, asking them to do. I hope that answered your question. Any other? There's a question uh, uh, kind of geared towards the presentation. Uh, uh, Michelle asks if uh, you guys can have access to the, uh, the slides. Uh, it, the slides will be posted in the chat um, she also wants to see if um, she if you could go back to the last slide, which you shared all the links. Sure. But like I said, all these links are going to be in the uh, presentation that I posted in the chat. So please keep an eye on that. Um, and that is, let's see. Okay, um, do you see a great deal of improvement in their performance from doing uh, these strategies? Absolutely, because I have students, again, they are uh, students that are not the, the uh, learning uh, English, they're just regular students that have not done well in school, that now want to go to college and be successful. And they, uh, they admit to me, that I hate reading. I don't want to, don't make me read. And they're sitting in my reading class telling me this. And so when I test them to see where they are at what level, then when we go through the strategies, then there's great improvement on, um, on when they actually take the, the, the last test, the, the final test. 
So yes, yes, there is improvement because it's non-threatening in the sense that you are breaking big pieces of text apart and you're working through very methodically what that text is about so that you can have comprehension. So yes, they do, they improve, they improve greatly. Any other questions? All right, I think that is the last question. Okay, I thank you for uh, coming to this, this seminar. I hope to see you sometime at another conference that we can actually look at each other and say hi. I appreciate what you do. It's, I know it's a struggle. This is not something that works overnight. You'll have to continually go over it until their voice, your voice becomes embedded in their head. That's how it works. And if you need any other passages, please email me and I'll send you some more links. Well, thank you, Iris. Uh, great session, lots of good information and strategies. We really appreciate it. Uh, so that wraps things up for our two-day conference, virtual conference, uh, without any major tech meltdown. So that's something to celebrate as well. Uh, I just wanted to give a special thanks to our team at FLC, Nicole, Aisa, Heather, and Susan uh, for making it all work behind the scenes and, um, and otherwise uh, bringing it all together, as well as all of our presenters, some truly excellent sessions. They're all recorded. So just go into the portal and go under each of the session listings and you'll see the, the recording for each of the sessions. If you wanna go back and revisit any of them or any of the sessions you might not have been able to, to attend. Um, we do have our auction fundraiser that's about to wrap up at 4 p.m. So go in, you can access that through the portal as well. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look or if you, if you have and you're currently bidding on items, uh, keep that um, time frame in mind. So we're gonna be closing that out um, uh, in a little less than an hour right now. So um, please complete your session evaluation for this session and then the overall conference evaluation, which you can find at, um, on the menu on the main conference page. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback. Um, this is something new for us and uh, we definitely want to hear from you as to what worked and what didn't work and, and what your thoughts were on the sessions you attended. Uh, so with that, um, we'll wrap things up. Uh, you all take care um, and stay healthy and have a good weekend.